Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. Uh, we are going to be starting with H962, uh, which folks remember was the um, relief from abuse bill and uh, service. Um, and uh, it has come back from the Senate with some very minor changes. Uh, and uh, so I am certainly gonna recommend that we concur, but before we do that, I'd like Eric to just walk us through and make sure everybody understands what the Senate did and um, see if you have any questions or concerns. So welcome, Eric, go ahead. Sure. Eric, I'm sorry, it should be, po it is posted, um, the changes. Oh, good. I think, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I sent it to Lori this morning and she indicated right. that she had posted it. So I think Great. you should have it. Okay, great, thank you. Great. Well, good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, as the chair was indicating, uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel, here to just go through quickly uh, the changes that the Senate made to uh, H962, which you recall is the act relating to uh, temporary relief from abuse orders uh, duration. Remember the big picture of what was going on there was that it was closing a gap that existed under current law so particularly when defendants did not attend the final hearing because you have temporary relief from abuse orders and final relief from abuse orders, temporary, temporary order only remains in effect for 14 days. So you had the issue that if the defendant did not turn up at the final hearing, uh, the temporary order expires after 14 days and there may be no order in effect. Uh, if the court issues a, issues a final order at that final hearing, well, it isn't in effect until the defendant is served. So if he or she doesn't turn up at that final hearing, temporary order goes away, it's not in effect anymore. The final order is not in effect because it hasn't been served yet. So you have this gap during which time uh, defendant is free to, um, free to ignore any of the conditions that were in the temporary order. They're not bound by any of the conditions in the final order because they haven't been served yet. So you have this period of time uh, where there's no order uh, in effect, uh, it's uh, requiring that the defendant obey with the conditions. So the solution in 962 uh, was to provide that, well, if the def uh, that temporary order that initially uh, is issued by the court for 14 days remains in effect until the final order is served. So that way, if the defendant doesn't turn up at that final hearing uh, and the court issues that final order, well, the temporary one stays in effect until they locate the defendant and serve him or her. So that way you close the gap. Uh, there is no period of time during which uh, the defend, uh, there's no order in effect uh, on the defendant. So what the House did, uh, sorry, what the Senate did was really two changes, one of which is purely technical. Uh, and as the chair said, very minor. The first one was just to provide notice to the defendant about the fact uh, that I just described, the duration that I just described. So in other words, the order, uh, the temporary order, when it's issued, says right on it to the defendant, hey, and if you look at the lang language on this, it's highlighted on page one, lines 12 to 15. It's just a notice provision. It lets the defendant know that if you don't turn up at the final hearing, then that temporary order uh, will remain in effect until the final order is served on you, unless for some reason that temporary order gets dismissed by the court, which could happen also. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, if the court does not dismiss that temporary order, it lets the defendant know so they have notice that um, not turning up at that final hearing is not going to be a way to avoid uh, being under, under the conditions of that temporary order because it's going to stay in effect until the final one is served. So it's a notification notice provision. It doesn't change the policy that, that you, effect, you enacted in 962. It just provides the defendant with notice of the policy. So that's the first one. Uh, second one, as I mentioned, is really a, a technical matter. Uh, this is just rewording uh, one of the sentences, uh, and that's on page three. You remember, in addition to this uh, uh, notice, or sorry, the effect of the final order and the temporary order on the defendant, another issue that came up really late in the committee hearings when, when you were looking at this uh, in committee before it went to the floor was, well, what if, because we're all talking about the defendant not turning up at the final hearing. Well, 
What about if the plaintiff, the person who's seeking the order, doesn't turn up at the final hearing? And you remember you added a sentence uh, late in the committee process to address that, that basically says, well, if the plaintiff doesn't show up, the person seeking the order, then the general rule is going to be that the, that the petition gets dismissed. So if the plaintiff doesn't show up, the person who's asking for the order, if they don't show, generally going to be dismissed. But you provided some language that said, well, if the court makes findings on the record why there might be good cause not to dismiss it, uh, then it might keep the order in place, um, even if the plaintiff doesn't turn up. And I think there was some sense down in the Senate that that language just needed to be clarified a little bit. Uh, there was a concern that that the way it was written, it might leave open the possibility that uh, this order could be in effect permanently, indefinitely. So if the plaintiff didn't turn up, then the then that temporary order could be in effect forever. And I know that wasn't uh, the intent. So they just clarified that language to say that, well, in those situations where the plaintiff doesn't turn up, the court can still continue the order if it makes good cause, but would, if it finds good cause, but only would be able to continue it until the, temp until the final hearing. So again, just making clear that that, that order doesn't remain in effect uh, you know, infinitely. Uh, it's only could be in effect if the plaintiff doesn't turn up until the final hearing if the court makes good cause to find a reason to extend it. So a more of a clarification and a language, uh, you know, making sure that that ambiguity wasn't there um, rather than any substantive policy difference, I think, than, than what had already passed the House. So so those that's it. Other than that, it's exactly the same as what, what passed the House. It's, um, as I say, a notice provision and a, and a language cleanup, and that was it. Great, great. Thank you, Eric. And my understanding is that uh, the witnesses that we heard from, uh, the Senate also heard from, and um, and that they are that they all um, support these changes. Yes, that's exactly right. Judge Grierson, uh, Sarah from the uh, from the crime victims, uh, as well as Matt Valerio and John Campbell as well, all testified that uh, that they were fine with those two changes. Great, great. Thank you. Sure. Any, any questions for for Eric? I'm not seeing any hands. Folks, jump in. Uh, so this will mean a uh, a form change, and uh, but apparently that is there's no problem with that. The court this happens all the time, and uh, as Eric said, uh, Judge Grierson was was fine with this change. So okay, well I'm not seeing any. Uh, See any hands? Uh, this could come up today for action in terms of um, whether or not to concur. So I wanted us to be be prepared. Um, if the speaker does ask us, I was the reporter of the bill, I believe. Um, so uh, I would entertain a a motion that we uh, concur with the um, let's see, it's a strike all amendment, but concur with the Senate. Uh, Strike all amendment to H962. Anybody so wanna... moved. Thank you. Second? I'll second that. Great. Thank you. Okay. Not are you ready? <laughs> yep. Great. Thank you. Maxine, are you sitting on the state house lawn? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not raining in Montpelier. Oh, here. I think it is. <laughs> Sunshine and 80 here. One second. Oh. Okay. All right. This was a 962, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Christy? Yes. Colburn? Colburn? Yes. Sorry, I, I was... Um, Muted. Yes. Yes. Ghost, ghost lamp. Yeah. Hashim. Yes. Not. Yes. Rachelson. We'll hold it open for her. She here. Oh, she's not here. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Seymour. Yes. Tully. Yes. Malone? Yes. Burdett? Yes. Grad? Yes. 
Okay. Great. Thank you so much. And I, Barbara, uh, let's see. So um, yeah, so Barbara, I'll let her know that she can. She she wrote her support in an email, but when she comes in, I'll, we'll just get her vote on the record. So oh, yeah. great. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Great. Well, I know you guys are working on S119 this morning, so good luck. Hang in there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so this went quicker than I than I thought. Uh, so I believe we have Bryn a little after 12. I think that's still what's going on. I think she's in Senate Judiciary right now, actually, on this bill. Um, but since we do have, have the time, I did want to start um, discussing, uh, discussing this bill. Uh, in terms of yesterday, we were talking uh, with uh, Commissioner Baker uh, and Representative Emmons regarding the, um, uh, the language from the Department of Corrections. And I know that at that time, uh, we were asked to put it on either uh, 119 or um, possibly 124, but 119 really seemed to be the, um, the best one. But um, I, have, um, I have spoken to Representative Emmons and I think it's better as a standalone bill uh, that, uh, you know, everybody could get their support behind. And so um, she will be doing a separate, um, a separate bill out of her committee, doing a strike all on a Senate bill that she has. Um, so we don't have to put it on, on this bill, which I, which I think is probably cleaner and uh, better in terms of process. So I won't be asking for, for your support on that particular DOC language here. So is that clear? Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. No? I'm sorry, Ken. What? It's no. No, it's not clear. We. It's, okay. You're at. That's going to be added where? So it's going to be a um a separate bill coming out of corrections. Um. Originally. Okay. Originally, um, we were asked to put it on on one nineteen. Uh, and uh, and that's why we had the, you know, the commissioner um come and talk to us. And uh, and then after thinking about it and consulting with Representative Emmons, I just think it's cleaner um, if it's not on this bill. Yeah, and, um, it'll get it'll get my support if it's not on this bill. Exactly. Thanks. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So. Bless okay. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> For now, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I had my hand up, Maxine. I don't know if you saw it or not, but sorry, um, no, thank you. I didn't. Yeah, but I just want to say that uh, I appreciate you not uh, uh, tacking that onto onto this bill. You know, one nineteen. Um, I mean, it's no secret that I'm not a fan of one nineteen, and uh, but I am a big fan of that language uh, uh, that the uh, commissioner Baker brought in. I mean, it's. It's uh, that language is so widespread as far as the good that it'll do through the whole correction system, you know, not not just with with inmates, but uh, the, the work that it can potentially do with, uh, you know, the, the uh, correctional officers, the administration, uh, you know, in corrections and uh, in it, it'll just uh, it, it should be a wave through the whole department. And, and that's certainly a good thing. And, um, and like Ken, it's something that I, I want to support. And if it was tacked on, um, I, I, I would have voted against it. So uh, appreciation to you uh, for, for uh, recognizing that and to, <clears throat> to Alice for um, putting in it as a separate bill because uh, there's always the chance that it, <clears throat> I guess it could have been attached to a bill that some people wouldn't have supported the bill um, and been in the same situation as uh, if we attached it to 119. So, so I, I think it's great that it is a separate bill. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, and appreciate appreciate your comments, uh, Ken. So, what Mr. Burdick just said, so politically correct and everything that I can't do. That's what I wanted to say, but he did such a great job. I just want to commend him on it. 
Thank you. you. I understood. You said it. You said the same thing, but differently. Thanks. Yeah. So that's that's how you take up your five minutes in a debate. <laughs> I liked your short and sweet much better, Ken, personally. Hey, hey, you know, hey, hey. <laughs> Lalonde, you're up to something if you're agreeing with me. We all know that. Okay. So, okay, great. So, so as I said, I do want to move to uh, draft um, 3.5. We'll have Bryn in about 10 or so minutes, but, uh, but before we start markup and committee discussion, I um, just want to say a few remarks. Um, I want to thank the many people and, and organizations that contributed to, um, to our considerations of the use of force uh, reform. We started this process in, in June with the passing of S219 and continued during our recess three public hearings, a survey that resulted in nearly 1,500 responses and weekly uh, planning meetings with the goal of ensuring inclusive and an inclusive and comprehensive uh, listening process. Uh, I want to especially thank uh, Representative Coach Christie, uh, Coach for your leadership on the uh, Social Equity Caucus and the caucus's concurrent discussions about 219 and the issues we were we are addressing and, and really keeping those discussions alive with a with a really diverse and and caucus. Um, I'm not sure people realize just uh, the time that that you and, and members have have put in. Um, I just want to rep uh, thank uh, Representative well. Lalonde for so does my dog <laughs> for convening um, the tripartisan planning meetings that also also helped us focus on the evolution of the bill and our public hearings. Uh, and our outreach, and there are many more leaders that I realize that I'm not um, not naming here, and I appreciate uh, Representative Van Donahue, Representative China, many, many um, folks went went into this. Um, and also, I want to recognize that we've been doing things differently in this recent session. Um, I appreciate the Senate Judiciary's engagement in possible amendments to the bill, and I. Thanks, Senator Sears, for taking testimony um, on these proposed amendments. They've actually been working at the same time that we have, and Bryn is going back and forth um, to just review different drafts, understand their concerns, and streamline the process, um, and which has given me a great understand of, of their concerns um, with the hope that we can come to an understanding and can you know, find a common ground and, and hopefully concurrence on um, on 119. Um, also want to thank many of the witnesses who testified before the committee. I structured the testimony by starting to um, hear from members of the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color communities. Um, I appreciate that there was concern at our public hearings that BIPOC members uh, were not given priority. And so I very much intentionally um, um, asked to hear from from them first, I reached out to over 20 uh, individuals based on a list of, um, of uh, witnesses that Coach and, and others gave to me um, to make sure that we were inclusive. Um, also, I um, wanna thank the Attorney General's Office and State's Attorneys for uh, meetings, hours of meetings to help us understand their, their concerns and possible ways to address them. So um, what felt like a fast uh, process was actually quite quite comprehensive um, that really started way before uh, these last few weeks and will continue um, beyond 119 because certainly this is as we've always said just one one piece of our ongoing work in terms of uh, in terms of racial justice um, so given that backdrop um, I do want to turn to um, 3.5 uh, and what I've um, what I'd like to do is go section by section, and uh, I'll help facilitate the um, the conversation, the committee discussion, and um, you know make a recommendation, perhaps based on the, the testimony that I heard, and then welcome um, input by by everyone here, and uh, and then the hope would be to, based on these changes, um, have a new draft that. Um, that we can that we can vote on um, later this well I guess it'll be afternoon, and uh, so do folks have three point five. It was posted on Tuesday. Yeah. So 
So, we good? Okay, great. So the um, so section one is the um, statewide use of policy. Okay, remember this bill has policy and then standard. And I would like to put out for discussion. Um, I would like to see this section come out based on um, Wilda White's testimony, uh, as well as the ACLU uh, and others. I also think that given the um, governor's executive order that that, that work is going on um, and, and that's also acknowledged in S-124, uh, which House Government, Op House Government Operations is working on. Uh, and so I would like to see this section come out that, I mean, I'm putting that out for, for discussion um, and let that work um, happen on its, on its own, but also recognize that um, I, I found Wilda White's testimony very, very compelling. So I'll, so let's open that up for discussion. And folks can jump in, raise hands, whatever, whatever works. Uh, Selena, great. Um, that makes sense to me. I would say I felt like um, Kai Morris's remarks really resonated with me as well yesterday um, about just the, cons yeah. So I, I think, I think um, you know, we know, we know this work is moving forward. We know the legislature in January will have the opportunity to, to look at what's come forward and consider whether that is the right basis for a statewide policy. Um, but I think I, I support taking this out too, based on the testimony we heard, um, not just yesterday, obviously, but, but ongoing throughout the process. Great, thank you. I should also add that um, Senate Judiciary yesterday, Martin and I were, um, were there, Martin stayed longer, but, um, but Senator White did say that, um, you know, that the, that the executive order in 124 really are addressing some of these um, issues and that, that I think she would support this coming out as well. Um, others? And thanks for mentioning Kaya, thank you. Yeah. Others? Okay, well, I'm not seeing anybody. Um, how about a, um, just like a, a show of hands that for the next draft to take section one out? So make sure nobody had any questions or not, or you're looking, any thoughts, questions? I'm, I'm just thinking, I was perusing over section one one more time, just to okay. make sure I'm- All right, well, let me, Give you a few minutes. And again, this is straw poll. And if you if you want to vote no, that's okay too <laughs> to take it out. But uh, I. Um, One, one question, that subsection D that's highlighted if a law enforcement agency or constable is required to adopt a policy and so on, um, are we gonna incorporate that anywhere else for the sake of um, acknowledging that all departments will have at least adopted the model policy or no? Uh, Martin. Can I, uh, jump in on that question? Sure. Cause yeah. um, so, so I have a, a uh, a proposal of an alternative for section one and, and I did uh, get the language posted uh, that would require a report uh, from uh, the Department of Public Safety uh, regarding the process uh, for developing this policy as well as uh, the final policy uh, asking for that by I think end of January early February I can't remember the exact date uh, the concept being uh, when they report back, 
the legislature can look at the policy, look at the process and decide at that point uh, if they believe that this is the policy that should become the uniform statewide policy and can then mandate that that policy uh, be adopted. And uh, related to that, uh, I would be suggesting a July 1st effective date uh, for the standards uh, so that the, the legislature would have the opportunity to look at this policy and decide if they want to ma uh, mandate it. So that, that's kind of throwing that out there as something to replace section one as opposed to just uh, completely eliminating the concept of what uh, of the policy or what we're going to do with the policy. I don't know if that helps with that question that you have uh, not or not, but. Yeah, a little bit. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Madam Chair. Um, sure, go ahead. Uh, I, I, th I would support uh, that uh, based on the testimony from all of the witnesses, you know, that we've heard, you know, I, I think that that's um, a reasonable compromise um, you know, for us as a committee to put forth, uh, because everybody realizes we do have the ability to statutorily require. And I think the uh, uh, amendment uh, or addition to the, uh, uh, the draft uh, that uh, Representative Lalonde is uh, proposing capsulizes those thoughts from across the board. And it seemed that that would be reasonable uh, for all of the parties, at least from what, you know, I was hearing, unless I heard something, you know, oddly, but I would support it. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I do think the report I forgot about that. We talked about this um, yesterday. I do think a report would be helpful because it would help us monitor what's going on. Um, and and also it could give, um, so this, it would be the training council for the most yep. part, which is which is also being, I think coaches you said yesterday, being restructured. Um, and so it would give them an opportunity to start this process. I started on October 1. Um, and so if they came to us in, February or something or, or January or whatever and said, you know, we really, you know, yes, here's that this initial, you know, report, this is how we're doing, we need more time. Um, there's, there's still time to make changes, you know, to, to whatever we, whatever moves forward in 119 if it, if it does. Um, so Tom, was your hand up to, um, to speak or to support? Okay. No, it's been up since uh, uh, yeah. earlier. Thank you. You're ready. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Selena. Uh, just a logistical question, because I'm looking at um, Martin's proposed language. Are, are, it just structurally, it would be like a new section five as opposed to just swapping out for section one. That's how I'm reading your this propo potential proposal of amendment here, Martin. Yeah, I think that that's, yeah, it would go towards the end of the bill, wherever we end up. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure why section five is what Bryn put in there, uh, but maybe predicting that maybe that's where it's it would a reorder. Or it would, yeah. Yeah, right. reordering. A re the idea reordering. would be at the end. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. Great. I so, like this. I like this language. It's good. Yeah. I'm just actually I haven't seen it. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. And we can look at that. We'll look at that language separately as as well. Um, but I, yeah, I think that's. Okay, great. So let me um, say this again. So just again, raise of hands to um, in support of taking section one out. One, two, three. Okay. Um, Can't find my hand. <laughs> Ken has lost his hand. Oh my. Okay. It it's not working. <laughs> there you go. Great. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. And then uh, again, we can hear from um, from Barbara. All right. Great. And so I'm hoping that when 
when Bryn is available, she'll she'll hop on because I think I'll I think we will need her. <laughs> um, all right, so so that takes us to section two and okay. So in terms of section two, um, in terms of the definition of, of force, my understanding. Um, and I'll, I'll name this now, but then when, when Bryn comes, um, I'm gonna ask her, ask her, um, her, her legal advice. Um, the AG testified that, um, that this language was, was vague, that it doesn't include a threat. Um, my understanding is that this language, um, so the physical co coercion, the question of whether or not that includes a threat, um, Julio talked about, you know, yielding a knife or something like that. Um, my understanding is that this language um, tracks, it's, it's not identical, but it's consistent with S219 um, that we passed earlier, as well as Title 20. Um, but I'm going to flag that for, for Bryn. Um, if anybody has any any thoughts on that now, but I do want to hear from Bryn and come back to that. But certainly if anybody has any thoughts or questions about that, you can jump in. Okay, so I'm just keeping a running, running list. Um, let's see. The next thing that, and again, if I if I skip over something that folks are have concerns or questions about, let me know. But the the next thing that I see as a um, decision point based on testimony, I'm on page four, section. Three, um, the set on line seven at the end, we talk about it says must be instantly confronted and addressed. And um, Chief Pete um, raised concern about about the word instantly. Uh, we also um, heard um, from Wilda. Um, we, we talked about the word immediately, and I know Wilda, um, she said preferred immediately because that, that's really the legal term and is, um, is perhaps, you know, more consistent. Uh, and I believe the AG said that, that that is consistent with current training. So my proposal would be to change the word instantly uh, to immediately. So I welcome, I welcome thoughts on that. I, I have a question. Why don't we just say imminently as, as we do in the first line? Or, or does it, I, I'm not sure what huge difference it makes um, to have immediately or imminently or why we would um, modify that actually. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Actually. Yeah, no, it's fine. I'm, re I'm reading it too. An imminent threat is not merely. But then you're defining, you're defining a word with a, <laughs> what's, that, what's that rule? <laughs> you're you know what I mean? Um, right. You're like defining the word with your, you're with the, defining the word with the same word. word. I think you repeated it. Yeah. Um, I thought what I heard, um, I'm sorry to just jump in, Maxine, without being. Actually, I see Ken's hand up, so. Yeah, yeah. So what line are you on, Maxine, that you're talking about? Yeah, so I'm on page four. Yeah. And on line seven. Okay. So the very last word um, of that, on page that seven. line. Yeah, and so. Yeah. So Chief Chief Pete brought it up. Um, yeah, I I got you on that. I'm sorry. I'm just just yeah. I know that part. I was trying to find which line you were talking about because 
well, kind of what Nada just said too, but I mean, I'm looking at line four and we have immediately caused death, which I mean, I think that's kind of what Nada was saying with uh, in, intimate and immediately, right? So why wouldn't we, I, I guess what I'm saying is the immediately, why wouldn't that work? Oh, I think I, um... I think immediately would work. Um, I believe I understood Nader to say, why don't we just repeat imminent up there? And the, what some of us were thinking is that we're, we're, we're trying to define imminent threat of death or seriously bodily injury. Can I answer? So- Yeah, well, kind of, but- Right down below that on line five, it starts, or in the middle there, an intimate threat is not merely a fear. I mean, it's, is that explaining it or am I totally misunderstanding that part? No, 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 you're, you are correct. And that's, that's the part that we're working in and whether or not the instantly confronted, whether or not that work, whether or not um, that's clear and whether or not it's consistent, also concerned whether or not it was consistent with, um, with case law. Um, but when I let Selena jump in and maybe that will help. Um, oh, I was just going to say, um, that I was, I was persuaded by the combination of the police saying we don't quite recognize that word instantly. And then, um, think we did and then I I feel like I we definitely heard um Wilda and maybe some others say yeah that's just like a more consistent language with case law and so to me that that combination of you know feedback just makes sense sorry I'm here I'm seeing my internet connection is unstable so I'm probably dropping out some but no okay no thank you uh Patrick and then Kim we'll go back to you I think that uh, immediately definitely is a little more clear than instantly. If it was just for the, the sake of uh, flow, I would use the word promptly, but then we have to ask if that's an appropriate word. Um, that's my two cents. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you. And, and again, immediately is, as uh, Wilda said, legally is, you know, it's, it's something that is used within the law. So, and again, um, that's something that my understanding is that law enforcement would be trained to. Um, so, uh, Ken, do you? I don't know if that if that clarified it or any thoughts or. Yeah, I mean, I'm still looking at. Um, I like what Seymour just said too, but that's. Um, Apparent intent to immediately cause death, immediately cause death. Um, apparent not is not going to work. Here. What was that word that Seymour used? Or that complicates it too much, so get that out of my mind. Yeah, I, I think, I, again, I'm, Patrick, correct me if I'm wrong, but Patrick threw out a word, I, don't, I forget if it was promptly or whatever, but then said, um, that he thought immediately yeah. worked and, under, and understood why. So when Celine cut out, what was the word she was using? Um, immediately, she she based on the testimony that she heard from law enforcement and um, and Wilda White and others, um, she was saying that it, that immediately did did sound like a a logical amendment. Can I can I ask what coach is with that? Sure, yeah, coach has his hand up, thank you. Um, when, I, when I put on my, uh, my technical hat, uh, I would say uh, I would lean uh, towards uh, this, uh, Wilda White's uh, explanation uh, 
not only for terminology component, but listening to the testimony from all sides. Uh, one of the things that uh, Commissioner Sherling mentioned was not creating new language that made it more difficult for the courts to process, you know, the judiciary component. So if we're using language that is already consistent with their thinking, it makes it easier to understand where we're headed. And I think that uh, Commissioner Sherling was, uh, you know, part of his uh, explanation as to why certain things needed to happen in uh, a reasonable process was to give the judiciary a chance to kind of be in line or not so much in line, but understand how things are changing. So if we're using the same terms that uh, the judicial system is used to hearing, we're not making the system more complicated. So I would support uh, immediately. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Kelly. I, I agree with the immediately and I, I, hopefully this is not too problematic, but what about also, in, it said it must be immediately addressed and confronted because I think that, I mean, just the concept that you're addressing it before you're confronting, I don't know if that, it looks like it's more thoughtful in the process. Just thought. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting, yeah. So it'd be immediately addressed and confronted. Thank you. No. Folks think about that. Seeing thumbs up. Okay. So again, straw poll in terms of making these changes on page four by um, changing instantly to immediately and reordering um, it, it'd be addressed and confronted. So, so what Kelly just said, can you just read that back to me one more time, please? Um, sure. So let's see. Um, starting on uh, line seven, but is one that from appearances must be immediately addressed and confronted. Yeah, I think that's okay. I think that's good. I think that's an improvement. Great, all right, thank you. Others? Okay, yeah, well. Good, Flo flows nicely that way. Okay, great, I'm not hearing any big opposition. And I, and I appreciate those of you who have said that you don't support the bill. I do appreciate you participating in this, <laughs> in this discussion. I, I do. I really do. Okay. Um, well, can I can I just clarify something? Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying something doesn't have to be changed. I'm not. I just. I'm not comfortable with everything in this bill, and I feel I know something has to get done i think it is being done i agree um i agree with uh the governor's 10 point plan and all that stuff and i just one of my biggest fears is for lack of a better word we're trying we're we're not trying we're rushing a bill into place that i am worried about more consequences that may 
not happen. And I know on top of this that we have a serious situation with mental health in this. And that's about as, as um, that's about as tactful as, not tactful, but that's about, I'm not, you know, I'm not politically correct. That's diplomatic as I can say it, if that makes sense. Right. No, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and, you know, having the effective date being pushed out for this, you know, for these standards, I am hoping, um, and the report, I'm hoping will will give time to see if, if those unintended consequences or concerns do, do in fact arise. So that's, so, but I, no, I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Let's see, the next thing I have. Okay, so also on page four, in five, the definition of um, prohibited restraint. Uh, I, I think it was the attorney general's office that wanted the word may back in there. Uh, and do folks remember that? Putting the putting May back. You said he wanted that. I think the attorney. I think it was the attorney general's office that wanted the word May back. There. Martin, do you have? Do you remember or Selena? Yeah, no, it, it was it was definitely Julio. But I also understand that uh, the Senate Judiciary wants uh, to have that word back as well. I like that. Again, I think I'm okay with that one too. Now my connection's breaking up. Did you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Others? Thank you. I like that because I think it's a little more encompassing. Yeah. Which is important, I think. And consistent with, um, more consistent with 219 too. Right, right. I think I think that's perhaps where the Senate was was coming from, or is coming from as well. Yeah. Okay. Any objection? Not hearing any objection. Come, come. Again, move on for now. Um, all right. Um, so in six, and this again, this is this is something that I'm going to flag for Bryn. Um, the Attorney General's office did means the conduct and decisions. Oh, and um, I think it was on line 17. Um, so is all facts known or reasonably available to the law enforcement officer? Uh, I think that was a suggestion of the attorney general's office. So I wanna ask for in terms of case law, um, interpretation, what, you know, et cetera. I wanna, I wanna hear her thinking on this. Um, and, Oh, there you are, Bryn. <laughs> I just saw, I just saw your name. Um, I think she just got on just this. Okay. Second. All right. All right. Hi, Bryn. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Are Are you good to join us, or do you do you want a a little bit of a break or anything? I know you were in the Senate Judiciary probably just until this very minute. Um, yeah, well, I have had a, about 10 minutes that I was having a call with another uh, another uh, legislator, but um, so I haven't been able to listen and I don't know how long you've been meeting. Um, okay, but can you can, can you join us? Can you join us now or do you need more time? Yeah, yeah okay. I can join you now. Okay, great. So I have my my aspirin list. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I can so 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 far we have um, straw poll you know, for the next draft. We've decided to take section one out. 
Okay. And then on um, page four, where we had a um, question regarding the word instantly. Yeah. Um, we've decided to, for the next draft, change that to immediately. And then Representative Tully had a, 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 a great suggestion that we all support, um, having it read immediately addressed and confronted. It just seems more logical you address something and is there any legal reason or why we, why we wouldn't wanna flip those terms? No, um, I don't think so. That, uh, that, that second sentence there does come from the California uh, statute. <clears throat> so um, there, that term addressed and confronted doesn't really come straight from case law. Um, so I, I think you could switch the, the order there without, without ha causing confusion. Okay, great, great, thank you. And then um, on the same page in um, five, um, line 12, um, to put the May back in there. And then, um, and then this is where we were. So, so under six, totality of the circumstances, I know there was uh, the, I believe it was the attorney general's suggested um, after all facts known um, or reasonably available to the law enforcement officer. Um, wondering what your thoughts on that if we if it's if it's included in that already if or if that's the standard already or if we if we do need that language. Yeah, um, so that's a, that's a decision for the committee. I think that, um, you know, all of these, all of these analyses are gonna be done um, from the reasonable person standard, a reasonable law enforcement officer in the same situation. Um, and that reasonable person standard typically involves what facts uh, person, the actual person knew or the person should have known if it's a reasonable, reasonable person standard. So um, I think it, by including that, all facts reasonably available, um, you kind of narrow that point. You kind of put a, a finer point on that um, by explicitly saying it right in the language of totality of the circumstances. Um, I think there is an argument to be made that since these, uh, um, these analyses are done from a reasonable person standard, that's already going to be included. Um, but um, it's up to the committee whether you want to whether you want to put that in there and, and make it abundantly clear that you also are looking at um, those facts that um, that are reasonably available to the officer or essentially that the officer should have known a reasonable officer should have known. Yeah, thank you. Uh, committee thoughts. A lawyer. A lawyer won't chew that up. I mean, really use that in so many different angles that uh, they have a tendency to do. I realize I'm in a room full of lawyers. No disrespect, Bryn. Not, none taken, but I'm not sure if that was a question for me or not. <laughs> I know. Uh, direct it with whoever wants to answer it. Well, I guess I like abundant clarity. Uh, and if you're clear, clearer in the language, as I think uh, Brent has just suggested, if we put in that or reasonably available, uh, that takes less arguments away from the lawyers having to, to make that argument that it should be included. So, I, I mean, I. I'm for uh, the abundant clarity of putting more reasonably available in there. And Bryn, you said it would, that it would narrow. No, I didn't, I didn't, oh. I think I didn't use that word, but what I meant to say is just put a fine point on it that in this analysis of what the totality of the circumstances is, is 
you want to make it abundantly clear that you want to include those facts that a reasonable officer should have known or facts that were reasonably available. Perhaps the officer didn't have them, but should have had them um, because they were reasonably available. I think that's, as Representative Malone said, it just makes it abundantly clear that that should be a part of that analysis. Okay, and how does that differ from should have known, which we've talked about? Um, I think that it's, you know, it's not typically used in a totality of the circumstances um, analysis right. of the case law that should have known. It is used in other places, uh, like the reasonable person standard, as, as you, I think, heard from the AG's office. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do believe that that all facts reasonably available was the suggestion of the Attorney General's office. Um, as sort of a, as, as a, as a midpoint. Okay. Um, and is, do you know if this was in the Senate or not in terms of concern either way or? Um, I don't think that, so they didn't, this is, the, they didn't have this particular language in front of them in the previous mm -hmm. draft. Mm -hmm. um, so I am not, I'm not sure um, where they would stand on this point. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So, it, but it, it, it's like put it in for the next draft unless I'm hearing any objections. Okay, great. Let's do that. All right. Um, Okay, Paige, the next one. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> Hello. Hi, how you doing? Thanks. Actually, your, your timing is great. We did um, vote to concur with the Senate. Um, and uh, so we'll, we'll get your vote, but yeah. So that's like a, a good, like a yes vote. Okay, so page five. Um, lines 10 and 11. Um, I think my understanding is, is that the Senate had some concerns um, doing their discussion about that. Um, they did their, I, I would not, I don't want to characterize the, the committee as a whole, but um, there were members of the Senate Judiciary Committee that expressed some concerns about that language. Um, because of how it differs from the language that came over in the Senate version. If you remember, um, the Senate version of this language was in B5, and it talked about um, allowing law enforcement to use uh, proportional force in order to effect an arrest of a person that law enforcement um, reasonably believed had committed a crime. Um, so in, in essence, the, the language here in B2 um, although it's sort of based on that language from the Senate, it does um, appear to provide that law enforcement um, can use that proportional, reasonable, and necessary force to achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective. Um, so the concern expressed by the Senate was that it may um, indicate that law enforcement could use force on um, you know, protest, I think the example that was raised was to clear protesters from, from the street, people who were peacefully protesting in the street. Um, it would seem to allow officers to use force in those, um, in those situations. That was just the, an example that was raised. Right, right. Yeah, and I also, um, my understanding of, of Wilder White's testimony was, was um, having that committed a crime which in there was, is very important. And then the way I read it to put or achieve any other law enforcement, it almost like negates the the importance of committed a crime or, or they seem inconsistent to me. So, um, so I could see taking out or to achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective. And then I'm, I'm not sure do we, I guess I would like your thoughts on while protecting the life and safety of all persons, whether we put that back in. Um, and, and just the sort of decision making around that and um, Right, so, so one, one way to sort of capture 
capture more um, more law enforcement conduct apart from just um, in order to affect an arrest or prevent escape would be to include some language about protecting the life and safety of, of, of any person. So one way you might do that is to include that language either at the end or at the at sort of near the beginning of the sentence. Um, to provide that a law enforcement officer shall only use the force objectively reasonable, necessary and proportional to protect the life and safety of any person or to affect an arrest, prevent escape and et cetera. So that, that would be one way to, to include other types of law enforcement conduct. So, so can I ask uh, uh, maybe not or a question that if he has any examples of where you're not necessarily um, affecting an arrest or preventing escape, uh, where you might need to use force to protect safety uh, or, or lives of others. Yep, um, you know, the thing that comes to mind for this specific example or this topic, uh, you know, Years ago, there was a person who was about to commit suicide on the Townsend Dam, and they were quite literally walking towards the edge. Another trooper got there about 30 seconds before me and was able to um, restrain them, which was a use of force before uh, they made it to the edge. Um, and then we brought that person to the hospital. Um, another time that I can think of is when I had to wrestle with a person who was on acid and was having a really bad trip um, and was close to hurting the people who was in the house with them. Um, so those are different circumstances where you might end up using force that where a crime isn't necessarily being committed. Uh, yeah, so does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I think that just suggests that we need to have some sort of language to cover that kind of situation. Yes. Yeah. Ken, are you? Yeah, thank you. So, so I know what we're trying to do and I, and I get it, but Martin just said the perfect words, some type of language to cover that situation. It seems like we're trying to cover, which I guess is our job, we're trying to cover every situation out there, but every situation is different. And that's what really concerns me a lot with this bill. Does that make sense? Yeah, and everybody's I quiet. No, I, yeah, I understand, uh, Martin. Yeah, no, I, no, that that makes sense, and that's that's why I think we're putting forth standards that, number one, are consistent with what case law says. Uh, I think we're actually clarifying some parts of what case law is in the Second Circuit in Vermont, uh, which, you know, is the relevant case law, and we're and we're keeping it broad enough so that it will cover all the situations. You know, it, it will cover the situation. It's it's it's. Um, general enough, but but it also is, it, it, it walks the line between being specific enough that we're putting forth standards that need to be followed, uh, it, but it's general enough that once uh, policy is put into place to implement this, uh, we can cover, we can cover all the, not all the imaginable situations, that's not possible, but, but I don't know if that made sense, but yeah, I think we've walked the line between getting too specific, which is why we backed off some of the things from the last draft is that we were perhaps getting a little too specific, but we wanna have these overarching standards put into place. Yeah, I, un I understand that, but us sitting around the table or in this case behind our desk, I mean, I mean Nader has, has just seen a lot of stuff dealt with a lot of stuff, law enforcement in general has spur of the moment. And in most cases, they, I mean, it shows they do the best that they possibly can. They, they still have to protect themselves so they can protect others. 
Can I chime in with something? Sure. Yeah. I think that, you know, I, I appreciate the points that Ken, or Ken is bringing up. Um, I think that when we're looking at the line or to achieve any other law enforcement objective, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the two different scenarios that I described. Both of them are very different circumstances, uh, but both of them, in my opinion, re required some intervention that did involve force, even though no crime had been committed. You know, you had one person who was suicidal and another person who was in excited delirium and was at risk, very serious risk of hurting, potentially hurting the other people um, in the house. So I, but I think that the line or to achieve any other law enforcement objective can serve as a catch-all for those scenarios, which are different in nature, but involve law enforcement and the usage of force. Let me ask uh, you a question, follow-up, uh, Nader. Um, so would it capture it if instead we shifted it to a, a, a protecting life and safety of others, as opposed to the, or achieving the other law, lawful law enforcement objective? I mean, do we still capture uh, what you're talking about? Because my concern is achieving any other lawful law enforcement objective, yet presumably a law enforcement officer is not gonna use force when they're serving legal process, one of, their, one of the things they're supposed to do. Uh, but that's one of the examples that I would think of, or this moving uh, protesters uh, from one place to another. Uh, unless there's a safety issue or an injury or life uh, issue, uh, it seems like we don't want to have any kind of crack in the doorway uh, to to be using force there. So, but let me, you know, with, I, I'm sorry, I added to that question. My question bottom line is that instead of that language and having language along the lines of what Bryn uh, stated as far as protecting life and safety of, of all persons. So I, I think I got your question. Um, I mean, you know, I think changing it to protecting life and safety of other persons will narrow it down a little. Um, you know, Drew Bloom would be a good person to ask about this, but you know, I, I um, yeah, I'm, I'm not certain. I, I think that it would narrow it down a little bit if you were to say to protect the life and safety of other persons. Um, whereas, or to achieve any other law enforcement objective, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, if, you know, drawing your firearm is technically a use of force, but, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be using it, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the circumstance or incident where you know, cops are executing a search warrant or an arrest warrant, and, you know, you have different officers in different areas with their firearms drawn in order to have different angles of you know, different views on the house or wherever they are. Um, and having those firearms drawn can be considered a use of force. But I think, I, I, I suppose that could, that could fall under what you're proposing actually, because it is in order to preserve the safety of the officers or potentially other civilians at the scene. So I'm, I don't know if that answers your question. I'm just kind of- Well, I, I guess I, I'm, I wanna, because you have experience in this and this particular provision uh, can go directly to what you've experienced and such to understand what uh, you think is the better route. Uh, even though the Senate doesn't like that language, uh, if, if you feel that going to the protecting life and safety is not gonna cover the situations where it's appropriate to use force. And I guess the other thing I would say in response, you know, I don't wanna base what our decisions are in the House Judiciary on uh, a, a Senate example uh, that they raised that, oh, this might be too broad. I mean, like we can walk through a couple, we can walk through that example. Would, would it be objectively reasonable to be using a uh, force of any sort to push people off of a, uh, if they're protesting and you wanna move them from point A to point B, you may have a legitimate lawful 
you know, you may have a lawful reason for doing that. Actually, I'm not even sure if you have a lawful reason for doing that, but uh, my legal process uh, example, I mean, would it be objectively reasonable for somebody, you know, for a law enforcement officer to pull out the gun when they're, you know, going and knocking on a door to deliver uh, a warrant or whatever, when there's no reason to think that there's any kind of danger? Yeah, I'm just throwing out, you know, I'm just trying to ponder this, that it, is it really a false concern on getting rid of the or to achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective? One other thing, and this is a question for, ponder that a little bit, Nader, but this is a question for uh, Bryn. I, I seem to recall that that language of achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective is something that one finds in, in case law as well as, as a standard that they look at for when force can be used. Is, am I misremembering that? No, uh, that's, I, I think you're right about that. Um, that cases look um, to whether or not law enforcement use of force was reasonable um, when law enforcement is carrying out any of their lawful objectives. Protecting the safety of others would be one of the law purposes for law enforcement as well. I'm not sure if that was a follow-up question for me. I yeah, think maybe that, that was a rhetorical question. I don't know, or, but I, I guess it is a question just, question. I may have some internet connectivity issues because I didn't, I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. No, I, I was just saying that I would assume that protecting the life and safety of others uh, is a lawful law enforcement objective. Yes, yes, it is. Um, sorry and, about that. That's okay. and, and does the use of of um, while protecting the life and safety of all persons, does that in fact narrow this more um, than if we if we were to leave in or to achieve any other lawful law enforcement objective? I think so. Um, I think it narrows it slightly. I mean, I think you there is an you, you could make an argument even that um, in the example um, raised by the senator about moving protesters that that you know that could also be protecting the safety of of any person if if you're clearing them from the street. Um, so I don't think it narrows it um, significantly. I think it, it does narrow it. However, I hope you can hear me because um, yeah yeah okay. Yeah. Well, why don't we um, why don't we put this to the side for now? Because it seems like maybe it needs some more more thinking. Let Nader think a little bit, um, unless unless anybody wants to say it. What's you know things to go another way. Um, all right, Bryn, I realized that I, I oh, yeah. Sorry, I can get, like, sometimes it's hard to get to the blue. Okay. Clean up. Yep. Um, yeah, I think it, it makes sense to put it to the side, but I would say I, um, my, my impulse um, is to try to narrow it a bit. I, I think, I, I think the Senate's concerns, um, as Brent has expressed them, resonate with me on that. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. All right, let's, let's flag that, come back to it. Um, I want to work for a little bit more and then we'll take a break. Um, Bryn, I forgot to ask you about on page three, um, line 17, talks about force means the physical coercion em um, employed by law enforcement. Um, the attorney general's office um, was thinking maybe it was vague, it wasn't sure if it um, uh, includes a threat. Um, it's wondering what you're, we're thinking if, if in fact this could um, include a threat or do we need to put the word threat in there? Um, I, you know, I, I think that physical coercion it is broad enough to encompass threats. Okay. Um, I, I wouldn't disagree that it's not it's not entirely clear if threats are included. Um, but but I think the way it's written, I would I would read it to include threats. But um, again, if if you want it to include threats explicitly, 
Um, I don't think there'd be anything wrong with adding, adding some language um, that would explicitly encompass um, physical threats. Anybody into putting it in there or, or threat? Yeah, you just, I yeah. couldn't quite hear you. Did you say, is anyone opposed to putting it in there? Or does anyone want to put it in there? Opposed. Oh. No. I, I guess I would uh, need a little more explanation as far as the ramifications of the change. Some uh, intended or unintended consequences, I guess I'd like to hear about. Rin. Um, so, the, you know, the, the word force is used in that section we were just talking about in B2. Um, so it talks about when law enforcement is authorized to use force. So um, if, if you're contemplating uh, that definition of force to include um, some kind of threat, for example, drawing a weapon or perhaps using a law enforcement canine, so not actually making physical contact with a person, but threatening physical, um, physical contact, um, you would, it, the question is really, do you want to make that, make it clear that you're encompassing that kind of force as well? Um, and as, as I just said, I think that physical coercion implies, um, implies that it includes, uh, threatened force. But, um, I think the question before you now is whether or not you want to add some language to make it explicitly clear that you are including physical threats in the definition. So, so uh... <clears throat> to me, being the layperson, uh, if a uh, police officer has a gun on his side, could that uh, be uh, uh, interpreted as a physical threat, just like the dog would be? I mean, it's just another tool. Right. I think you have heard some testimony from law enforcement that just um, the presence of a law enforcement officer in a room can be um, perceived as 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 a threat. Um, so. I'm not, you know, again, I don't think that physical coercion, I'm, I'm, I don't read physical coercion to include just the actual presence of a law enforcement officer, but, um, but you have heard some testimony that, that, that conceivably it could. So um, I think that, you know, the question is really how explicit do you, do you want to be in the definition? Right. So again, a little clarification. So the way it's written now is, is is broad and this would narrow it is is that is that right or i don't it the other way? <laughs> i don't think that's the intent i think it's to to clarify it right Bryn? you know yeah i do yeah. think it, it would offer some clarification as, um that you know to make it abundantly clear that you're you're including threats as part of physical coercion um, I, I don't necessarily think it would narrow it because, as I said earlier, I think that physical coercion could be interpreted to be broad enough to encom encompass. Um, right. So, so that would, that could potentially just be an interpretation by the person who's being investigated. Right. Um, what, can you will you will you clarify that question for me? Is it, is that a question for me? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll try. So. Depending on the situation, whether it's a, uh, a, I don't know if the term is billy club or not, but, <laughs> a, a, you know, a taser or a gun or a dog, um, in some situations, some, I guess, depending on the, the person, because everybody's different, some may take, uh, not take that as a, uh, a, a, as a, a threat, I guess, and, but others might. And it, it just potentially could be confusing, I guess. I don't know if that clarifies it or not, but. Right, so you're thinking about like the subject, subjectively what um, what might a subject think is a threat? Yeah. Right, so, you know, that, that may be um, a factor that would lead the committee to think that it might be appropriate to add some more language there to make it clearer to law enforcement what it means, what the use of force actually means. Um, in the context of carrying out their duties. Okay. Evan, with something real quick. Yeah. The 
the presence of police officers and canines as, it, as has been brought up is something that you know, cops are told to take into consideration. And it's also something that, you know, you know, I work with defense lawyers now and that that's also something we take into consideration is, you know, if you're, if you're a suspect sitting in a room with one officer and they're asking you to waive Miranda, that's not exactly a coercive scenario, but I've also seen footage of a person who was on the side of the road who just got yelled at by three cops as well as a canine. And then they're trying to get consent to search the vehicle that can be considered coercive, but you have to look at the totality of the circumstances and what a reasonable person would think. You know, if, if a reasonable person is surrounded by three cops and a canine, and one of the cops just yelled at you to try to get your voluntary consent to search a vehicle, that can probably be considered a coercive scenario. But sure. if you're in a room with, an, with one cop, one suspect, and they're trying to get you to waive Miranda, not exactly coercive. So not a, what do you think about putting the word threat in here? Um, that was, can you just, I got a little bit lost on exactly what page we're on right now. Can you? So, um, so page three, uh, line 17, it says, right now it says force means the physical coercion implied by a law enforcement officer to compel a person's compliance with the officer's instructions. So the question is, should we say physical coercion or threat? Uh, Bryn is saying she thinks that that threat um, is included here, but we also could put it in if we wanted to make it abundantly clear that it is included. I mean, I, I don't know if it's entirely necessary. And you know, my instinct is to defer to um, case law as it relates to that, but um, okay. I don't know right. that it's entirely necessary um, to, I think it would be redundant if we included the word Right, okay. I think it covers it. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, let's hear from Ken. Uh, Ken, did, did I just hear? I hope I can ask this question. Did I just hear uh, uh, Nader say that he's working for defense attorneys now? Yep, about a year and a half now. <laughs> is that is that new? It is to me. Well, hey, um, um, welcome. No, that that. <laughs> So that's not where I'm going. Don't get nervous. So um, it just gives me an, uh, um, just gives me a new perspective, a different way of looking, more of an open mind to look at things. That's not a bad thing. I just want a clarification. Thanks. Great. Okay. Thank you. So let's um, let's not add the word threat then. Okay. So um, I, in terms of my list, so page five, or we'll come back to that. We'll leave it. Um, we'll leave it as it is now and come back to that. Uh, so page seven, I, my, I think this is where yesterday we were talking with Wilda, um, where there was language that um, that was proposed um, that she really felt like if that was in there, that would be a win. I believe that was her testimony. Um, Bryn, do we have, where, um, I know we have that somewhere. Um, it would be under my name yesterday on, uh, uh, online on the website. Okay. Uh, does anybody have it right in front of them to read it while I? Uh... I do. Yeah. Um, and and Representative Lalonde will correct me if this is wrong, but what I have is that um, it would fall under subdivision B five, and it would be okay, so, right. So so basically B. Right. So so right now B five is all page six is out. And then, okay, um, page seven, so it would go. Right, so if you're looking at draft 3.5, it would be that language in yellow at the top of page seven. That's where 
so it wouldn't be actually that language. It would be um, the substitute language proposed yeah. yesterday. Yeah. So it would read, when a law enforcement officer knows or reasonably should know that a subject's conduct is the result of a medical condition, mental impairment, developmental disability, physical limitation, language barrier, drug or alcohol impairment, or other factor beyond the subject's control, the officer shall take that information into account in determining the amount of force appropriate to use on the subject, if any. So let me just jump in real quick because that language is slightly different from what I uh, uh, had posted yesterday. And it adds that or reasonably should know. And my understanding is that that was something, Brendan, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that the uh, Senate looked at this language and wanted to add the language or reasonably should know, which I certainly accept as, as you know, proposing this as an amendment to the Okay, and then, and so that, so lines four, what you just read, Bryn, lines four through nine that I'm looking at would also come out? Right, that would replace the language yeah. on. Okay. Lines four through nine. Okay, folks wanna hear it again? That would be great. Yeah, again, yeah, yes. so. Um, should have known it. So yeah, Bryn, go ahead. So I'll, I'll read it with that should have known language then. And where exactly are we in the uh, in 3.5? We're at the top of page seven. Um, there's language that's in yellow on lines four through nine at the top of page seven that um, what I'm about to read would be substitute language for those, um, for those lines, nine through 12, or I'm sorry, four through nine. So instead of saying a law enforcement's failure, it would say when a law enforcement officer knows or reasonably should know that a subject's conduct is the result of, and then there's that list of factors, medical condition, mental impairment, developmental disability, physical limitation, language barrier, drug or alcohol impairment, or other factor beyond the subject's control, the officer shall take that information into account in determining the amount of force appropriate to use on the subject, if any. And then the should, I'm sorry, I'm, the, the should have known language. Right, so that's, um, that that would be in the first part of the sentence, and that was uh, I I believe that um, Representative Lalone is correct that there was some conversation in the Senate um, when when Representative Lalone presented that substitute language to the senators, there was a, a desire on their part to include that reasonably should have should know um, clause as well. Okay, All right. Well, I um, again I know that we had compelling testimony from Will DeWhite on this section. Um, this is very important. Um, so I think that um, along with um, the should have known language, I, I would like to see that, that substitution here. Um, Maxine, <laughs> should have known in, uh, uh, replacing the officer's failure to take into account. Um, so yeah. I don't have that. I don't have the language in front of me. So I'm trying to remember while yeah. looking at the uh, uh, 3.5. Yeah. So Bryn, do you, do you want to read it again or tell us again? Yeah, it, it's, Bryn, could you also, could you email just that language to uh, Lori so she can post it so folks can see it as well? I'm running out of devices here. <laughs> And I can send it to everyone's email as well, if that would be helpful. Sure, thank you. Yeah, great, thank you. So can I So this is gonna be on a, a okay. or law enforcement has prior history on that's where Ken, this I don't know if part anybody is being else couldn't with. hear you. Correct. Ken, Ken, we missed about three quarters of that. 
Yeah, Ken, can you turn turn off your video and maybe that'll work a little better? You were breaking up. Yeah. Just, just see, I already did that. So this is on a reoccurring uh, situation with law enforcement that has past history with this subject, correct? That's really what you're dealing with with this part. Rin, um, so what the, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think so. Not necessarily because it provides yes. that if law enforcement knew or they reasonably should have known that one of these factors was um, responsible for the subject's conduct, then the law enforcement, that it essentially imposes a duty that the law enforcement officer has to consider that information in deciding whether or not to use force. And if so, what what amount of force to use? Um, so it again imposes that um, that that reasonable law enforcement officer standard. Um, so even if the law enforcement officer doesn't have a prior history um, with with these kind of factors, um, if a reasonable person should have known that these um, one of these factors was present and responsible for the subject's conduct. And then it does impose that duty on law enforcement to consider that information in determining whether or not to use force. So, so again, we're right back to where law enforcement is supposed to make a split decision about what's reasonable and what's not. And I know I'm treading on gray area, but sometimes there's no time for that split second reaction to for protection of everyone. And that's what concerns me. So just to make clear, I think that the bill and the standards here and Bryn can interject on this. Uh, if, if there's only a split second to make that kind of decision, uh, the law enforcement officer can make that decision and, and should make that decision. But it, it accounts for other situations where there is plenty of time, like the Grennan situation. Uh, there's a case that uh, at the end of May on the, in the Second Circus, uh, Second Circuit, not Second Circus. <laughs> Apologize for that, Second Circuit. Uh, we do we do say the Ninth Circuit, uh, actually, but in any event, uh, that the, the in that situation, during the course of an hour and a, uh, over an hour, it became very clear the individual had uh, a mental health uh, crisis uh, happening and was not a danger to anybody. Um, so it, it it doesn't prevent Ken. I don't think. Uh, I'm quite sure, again, Bryn can uh, comment on this. It's the totality of the circumstances, which definitely includes timing, definitely from the perspective of law enforcement officer. And if they come upon a situation and the person has a gun and the, guy, and the law enforcement has a split second, they don't have to ponder whether the behavior of the individual is because of any kind of impairment when the gun is pointed at them. It's, it's simply not providing or requiring that in this bill. Right. Bryn, did you want to add anything or? I, I was just going to say, I do, I, 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 um, I think that's a good explanation um, of the context here. And um, all of these decisions are, you know, all these factors are being evaluated in the totality of the circumstances. Um, so that's an important point to remember. Okay, great. So I, for the next draft, um, I'd like to have this substitute language. Is folks good? I'm not hearing any objections. Okay, we're we're getting there, <laughs> at least for at least for my list. Um, okay, the next one I have on page eight. Um, my understanding is that there was concern, uh, let's see, line 14 with the uh, word surrenders. Um, 
So law enforcement officers shall cease the use of deadly force as soon as the subject surrender or no longer um, poses an imminent danger of death or seriously, seriously bodily, bodily injury to the officer. Brandon, any uh, help us with that one? It could, it, let me just interject real quickly, Maxine, if I could. Okay. Uh, in, in the uh, document that's posted under my name today uh, has the alternative language that Brenda is going to be uh, pointing to, I believe, uh, that she provided uh, to me uh, at my request to address this particular issue on that paragraph uh, three. So posted today. Okay. And it's, all right. Oh, it's with the report language maybe or? Uh, yeah, it's in the same document, but it's at the bottom of the, that document. Okay. C3. All right. So law, law enforcement officer shall cease these. No longer poses an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. Yeah, so thank you for that um, introduction there. Um, so I, I just sort of reworded the section a little bit to um, try and address the concerns that were raised um, in the Senate committee meeting and also to address a concern that I think the Attorney General's office raised about there being some different words in this section um, that may, or that there was a possibility that they could conflict with the actual standards set out in C1. So I just changed some of the wording to, so um, it provides that uh, law enforcement has to stop using deadly force as soon as the person is under the officer's control or no longer poses an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury. So that language corresponds more closely to um, the actual standard for the use of deadly force in C1B. Um, um, it uses that um, same, same more closely aligned language there. Yeah, that's good. And can I ask a follow-up question on that? Sure. So, so the concern, and I don't think you were in the committee at the time when it was raised by uh, Julio Thompson, I don't think. Um, the concern was that it was inconsistent, particularly with C1B, uh, that, and the language is a little bit different, uh, but can you comment on whether somehow this new, the subsection C3 doesn't apply or does apply to C1B, you know, the fleeing felon situation. Right. So, I mean, I think that this new language corresponds a little bit more closely with that, with C1B. So, you know, again, just as a reminder, what the standard does is allow law enforcement to use deadly force in those two situations, either to defend against an imminent risk or an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury um, to the officer or to another person or to apprehend a fleeing person for any felony. And then there's those additional criteria that have to be met, like the felony has to have threatened or resulted in death or serious bodily injury. Um, and the officer also has to believe that um, the, the subject would cause death or serious bodily injury if they weren't immediately apprehended. Um, so I think that the way it's redrafted here is, is intended to encompass both A and B. So once the person is under control, the control of the officer, I think that would apply in, in, in C1B, then the officer can't use deadly force any longer. They have to stop their use of deadly force. Or as soon as the person no longer poses that imminent threat um, as provided in C1A, then the officer has to stop the use of deadly force. And does, that, does that answer your question? Um, yeah, and Selena has a question. I just wondered, Bryn, if you could, um, read us again the proposed um, change just to this language just trying to catch sure. a little um, so it's 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 largely similar so it starts a law enforcement officer shall cease the use of deadly force as soon as the subject is under the officer's control or no longer poses an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury to the officer or to another person okay thank you yeah, and again, it's it's posted um, as uh, as part of section section five. Um, well, I mean that's a it's, it's posted under um, the report language as well, so it's it's there. So Great. See it. so there's really only a couple of words that have changed. If you're looking at the language in three point five, 
So it says as soon as the subject surrenders in draft 3.5 on, on, on line 14 of page eight. So that word surrenders is changed to under the officer's control or no longer poses um, an imminent threat of death or serious bodily injury as opposed to an imminent danger. Um, because then we're, we're corresponding more closely to the standard set forth in C1. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Thank you. So, okay, so under the part about under the officer's control, is it the person that we want under the officer's control or the situation is under control? I mean, I just wince at under an officer's control. That just seems, I mean, and it's important that it's or, so if they're no longer a threat, then that shouldn't matter, but it just sits with me funny. And I'm wondering if that's, um, maybe it's just me, but I, I wanted to see if we really mean the person is under the officer's control or something else. So it does refer, I don't know if that's a question for me or for the committee, but I would just say it does, it does refer to the subject, the subject being under the officer's control. And I think that, um, you know, the reason it's, it's written that way is because of the standard as it, as it set forth in, in C1B, which is to apprehend that fleeing person, because there are those criteria for, for, for when deadly force is authorized to apprehend a fleeing person. Um, and you can find that language in, in C1B. The person has to have committed a felony, a violent felony, and the officer has to reasonably believe that the person will, um, will cause death or serious bodily injury if they're not immediately apprehended. So, so I think then why aren't you saying they've been apprehended? Is that the same thing as under control? I think that no, I don't necessarily. Okay, all right. Uh, I think apprehended often means that the person is placed under arrest. So the person may not be handcuffed yet. Um, Representative Hashim can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I would read apprehended as actually um, arrested and under control may, may, that may be prior to arrest. Okay. I just was worried about how submissive under control might be be. And again, I, I might be off base here. Okay. Tom. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to uh, kind of defer to, to Nader on, uh, on that also, because it just seems to me that there could be uh, different, different levels of under control. Um, you know, telling somebody to sit down, maybe one level of under control and another level maybe wrestling with them and getting them in handcuffs, I guess. But um, I, I guess I would like to hear Nader's perspective on that. So the first half of this, somebody was ringing my doorbell to drop off a package. So I missed part of the conversation, but is your question, um, can you repeat your question for me? Yeah, I, I guess, uh, uh, I, I think you're, are you talking to me, I assume? Or, I mean, yes, if, if you okay. were. Yeah, um, I, I guess a, uh, examples or definition of under control, because to me, it seems like uh, it could have a, uh, uh, be a, a pretty big umbrella, I guess. Uh, and the examples that I used is you, you potentially could have somebody under control just by, you know, telling him to go sit over on the curb that to me, that would be a type of being under control or it, uh, to get somebody under control, maybe uh, uh, wrestling with them and getting them in handcuffs. And, and that's, that ends with a question mark, so. Yeah, I mean, you, you, know, you, you have verbal commands in which you can tell someone or order someone to you know, sit down and then you, you speak with them for a while and they start calming down if they're in some sort of excited state prior to that. And you know, issuing those verbal commands, whether they're orders or you're asking someone to do something, that can be a form of control. Just as wrestling with someone and putting them in handcuffs is also a form of control. Okay. 
Great, thank you. Ken? So going back to what Barbara was saying about uh, an officer has control, or I, I believe that's what she said, somebody has to have control and it's going to be the officer that's trying to get the situation under control. So, so why would that be questionable if I, if I understood what she was saying correctly? Can I answer that? Uh, I hope so. Sure. Okay, so many times we're all under our own self-control and the situation is under control. So I don't know. All right, well, let's, uh, let's keep moving. Um, okay, so, so we've got that language. Uh, you know, everybody is tired, but we're, we're close. Um, so the next note that I have is on page nine, um, line eight. And uh, let's see, Bryn, can you help me? I guess it's maybe the last sentence we were talking about um, omitting, and I don't know if we do do this now or we go on to section three or if you can um, refresh my memory on, on the issue here. Sure. Um, so there was uh, in the in the Senate hearing about draft 3.5 yesterday, there was um, some concern that was raised about uh, subdivision C8 um, as the committee sort of got stuck on this section and um, in connection with, with this, there's the language here in C8 about um, law enforcement's right to self-defense, raise the self-defense, um, defense under common law or justifiable homicide. Um, there's some additional language um, on page 10, which is in the next section, section three, the prohibited restraint crime. Um, these are the, the, two, the two areas that the Senate had some concern. Um, so I can, um, I can talk a little bit about how, what, how I, I floated an idea to the Senate about some different language there. Would you like me to talk about that? Sure, thank you. Okay. Um, so the way, the way uh, C8 is drafted now is it provides law enforcement doesn't lose the right to self-defense. Um, if they use um, force in compliance, deadly force in compliance with C1 through C4. Um, so those are the, the standards that are set out that um, refer to the standards for use of deadly force in C1. Um, C2 is sort of the description of the word necessary in the context of the use of deadly force. Um, C3 is the section we were just talking about, um, ceasing the use of deadly force once the, once the subject is under the officer's control or there's no longer an imminent um, threat to the officer or to anyone else. And then C4 is um, that the law enforcement officer can't use deadly force against somebody who only poses a threat to themselves and not to another person. So, um, Essentially, what's what the way this this section is crafted is it says that law enforcement isn't going to uh, lose their right to self defense as long as that use of force was in compliance with those specific subdivisions. Um, and you'll note it doesn't include the subdivisions, for example, about prohibited restraint. Um, so I think the idea here was to provide that if a law enforcement officer does use a prohibited restraint, but that the use of that restraint is in compliance with um, C1 through C4, then they would not lose their right to common law self-defense or raising a justifiable homicide uh, defense. So um, there was, because the Senate got hung up on this language a little bit, um, I floated the idea of um, instead create, putting, putting a specific directive in the justifiable homicide statute. Um, so it might be a little bit tricky to talk about that without, without the statute in front of you. Um, but 
essentially you, you do have it in the bill in draft 3.5, you have that um, justifiable homicide statute in section five on page 11. So what, what draft 3.5 does is um, in on lines 15 and 16 of page 11 is recraft that subdivision three that provides the justifiable homicide defense for law enforcement. And it says, as long as law enforcement use force or deadly force in compliance with the standard, that whole standard in section two of the bill right now, then um, they shall be guiltless under, under the justifiable homicide statute. So um, the, other, the other, the way I floated to the Senate, the, the other way you could do this, essentially achieve the same objective is to provide that um, law, law enforcement who uses force in compliance with subdivision B2 of the standard or deadly force in compliance with subdivision C1 of the standard um, could raise the justifiable homicide defense. Um, so that way it sort of leaves out uh, that, that prohibition on um, prohibited restraints. So I know that's a little complicated, especially when you don't have the language right in front of you. Um, I'm sorry about that. So, and, and then the subsection eight would be deleted, right? Right. On page, page nine, subsection eight. So this right. is in lieu of that, right? That would replace that subdivision eight, exactly. Again, this is not um, some, this is just a suggestion. Um, if, if, can, can I just step up, uh, Maxine, just to yeah. one step higher level on this question because it's gonna take into account a couple other possible changes I understand from the Senate. And that's really my understanding with respect to prohibited restraint. Uh, what we want to, to do is make sure that a law enforcement officer who is in a situation where uh, it's really being used for self-defense, it's being used in a situation where there's deadly force uh, is justified, that in fact that, that law enforcement officer, presumably the prosecutor would not even charge the law enforcement officer with, with homicide under the, or, or, or with the prohibited restraint crime, uh, if in fact that's the case. And, we, and I think that we've wanted to, I think there's been an interest certainly in, in ensuring that, that that situation is covered. And it's been a matter of how do we cover that without twisting ourselves into a pretzel. Um, so I think that this is the idea of how to, to cover that is to, you know, we tried this paragraph eight, which was awkward uh, and, and I guess once the Senate started pointing that out, I can see that it's awkward. Uh, we've provided it uh, in this new on page page ten, subsection C, that new that new section, um, which frankly I think is a little awkward, and I think is also unnecessary. And let me this is not an argument we've heard, but let me throw it out there because it's kind of the broad subject that's kind of is really the last one we have, I think here. Um, it's awkward because there are other crimes, including assault, uh, uh, aggravated assault, homicide, et cetera. Uh, and, and none of those in those statutes, so in those offenses, do they talk about what the defense is? You know, the defense is under the justified hom homicide statute currently, or it's under common law. So it's a little odd that in this one instance, uh, we're putting a defense in here that is available, uh, but it's available in the appropriate place, which is in the justified homicide uh, uh, statute, which, which we would be amending uh, as, as uh, Bryn uh, suggested, uh, as well as uh, uh, the common law defense. So, so I think, you know, it, as I understand it, getting rid of paragraph eight, and then frankly, getting rid of all of uh, the changes that we have in subsection three, the law enforcement use of prohibited restraint uh, by eliminating that, meaning that we're just keeping what we passed in 219. Uh, and then this change that Bryn has talked about in the justifiable homicide, that gives law enforcement the coverage that presumably prosecutors will look at in, in the first instance on whether to even charge 
uh, such a crime. Uh, so, so that kind of encompasses a lot of these, <laughs> the, the changes, but uh, I do have one comment though, when we get to it, as far as what your proposal is as well, Bryn, but, but I kind of will leave that out there and see if I've made any sense whatsoever <laughs> on what we're trying to do here. Right, and so Martin, in terms of, um, so the, in, if we go that way, the entirety of section three, right, would right. come out. And, um, and I know that ACLU, in, in terms of section three, the testimony from ACLU um, and AG's office, I, you know, I, I, I think they all said, you know, in or out, it didn't, it, it didn't matter. So I, so I think if we do take three out, it, you know, it will be consistent with the testimony that we, that we heard. And then I think, I think, you know, I think it does clarify that that, that defense is still there. And, that, and that's important, you know, my understanding that's important to law enforcement. So Bryn, did I get that right? <laughs> you did. Um, and, you know, I think that you and I had that conversation earlier that typically we, we um, as, a, as, a, as a general matter, legislative council doesn't like to specifically refer to defenses in one statute and not another, um, because then it, it may get confusing about why, why you're not explicitly providing that a person has access to the common law um, defense of self-defense in, in other assault statutes, for example, or... So the one comment I would have as far as your proposal on uh, the, that's not your proposal, you don't propose anything, but you floated this to try to deal with the Senate's issue is I think for 2368 on page 11, line 16, I think it's a little too narrow to say just uh, for deadly force pointing to C1. I think at a minimum, one needs to point to C1 and two, or maybe even C1 through four, uh, because, you know, it's, it's not, you know, the standard is further delineated in the paragraph that talks about what ne necessary means and also the situation as far as uh, dealing with somebody who is only a danger to themselves, et cetera. So is there a reason not to extend it to C1 to four for the deadly force? Um, no, I don't, I don't think that there is, um, if, you know, again, it's up to the committee, what particular aspects of the policy you would want, or the standard you would want to include. Um, I, I named C1 because that's sort of the standard for, um, for the use of deadly force. But again, you're right that the other, C2, 3, and 4 provide some more particulars to that standard. And it would just be a policy committee whether or not to leave out the other portion. Policy decision, sorry. Right. Maybe I think I'm looking at the time and we actually need to make sure that we, um, you know, around quarter of 10 of we get on the floor and, and we haven't had a break. So what I'm gonna, um, so two things, I just checked with the speaker. Um, what I'm gonna suggest is I'm gonna just quickly um, because we're very close, finish up, ask Bryn to do another, to do the next draft, to get it to us. And then um, can folks um, come in tomorrow morning from 8.30 to 9.15 to review it and vote? As opposed yes. to asking, as opposed to yes. asking for, you know, leave from the house and... Um... Yes. All right, yeah. okay, so let's... Um, so a few things back on, you know, that, that language that we we're talking about that we put to the side, let's just leave it as is the, um, you know, uh, law enforcement purposes, whatever, um, go with what, what Nader was more comfortable with. Um, where we're talking about now, take out eight and then um, all of section three and then add in the, um, Sorry, I was talking to the speaker, so I'm not sure where we landed in terms of C1 through 4 or whatever, um, but it sounded like there was a, a recommendation there. 
Um, and so then, let's see. So then Bryn, that would, that would mean, let's see, so section, yeah, I don't think I had anything on section four. I think section uh, four needs to be deleted. Uh, deleted, okay, all right, got it, thank you, okay. Just just for consistency with the other changes. Right, okay, and so then, and then Bryn, you would add all the repeals and all of that stuff, right? I mean, I'm not gonna go into that now, but that, that stuff would have to be, be changed. Right, so the, the, repeal, the repeals would stay in, um, but it sounds like, um, it, yeah, you may want to change the effective date um, as well. I'm not sure if you if you did want to change the effective date right now. You have it uh, set to take take uh, effect on September 1st of next year. Right. I think I think earlier we talked about having this report that has been posted, and then maybe do what well, maybe July. Is that am I right? I mean, I floated that uh, as an idea. I, I don't think uh, others push back one way or another on that. But. Okay. No, it, it seemed it seemed fine. Otherwise, we would have. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, what, what, one real quick thing, Maxine, is is uh, in in deleting section three, also section seven would on page twelve would be have to be deleted as well. I know Bryn knows that, but uh, just to flag that for everybody else. Okay. The only reason why section seven is in there is because we were changing uh, the prohibited restraint crime and uh, from 219. And there's a technical reason that I don't understand, but <laughs> that we had to have that in there if we were going to be going back and, and modifying that. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Nader? Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to revisit that I heard um, discussed earlier in the current version or not, but um, the topic of using force on someone if they only pose a threat to themselves, is that still in, in this version? Page, page eight, um, line four. I mean, uh, uh, paragraph four, line 16 to 20. Oh, so deadly force, not just other. That's just deadly force, right? Just wanted some clarity there. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, Bryn, do you have what you need from from us? I do. Okay. And so, um, yeah. So, I think if um, I think we're going to be on the floor for a long time, which is why I'm not recommending coming back later. Um, you know, I suppose we can see how it goes and Tommy and I can kind of check in with each other to see if, if we can go come back as a committee, but, but let's hold on to 8.30 to, um, 8.30 to 9.30 tomorrow. And Bryn, when you do have a, um, a draft, if you could send it to, to the committee um, to, to take a look at, um, that would be great. And, um, and I understand that, like other times, it won't be edited, um, and that before, but but that way, and, and every you know, take a look and um, you know, with any questions. Sorry, oh, go ahead. So, is, uh, I, I guess I'd never asked this question. Is there a, a difference between a clean copy and uh, a new draft at this point? And, and I realize it won't be proofread, so there could be you know some very minor stuff in it, but I, I guess I would like as clean a copy as possible. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if, if, if you could give us, or give me, cause I'm the one that's asking, I guess, a, a timeline of, of when do you think that might happen, Bryn? I can get it out um, probably within the next 30 minutes. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so, no, nah, not that I was pushing, it was just, just, uh, uh, just inquiring. When you say a clean copy, uh, typically I put um, the changes between the versions in yellow highlight. Is that something that the committee would like to see or are you hoping to have just a, uh, a plain draft without any highlighting? I, I would like uh, a changes versus what we got over from the Senate because I think that's what's most relevant at this point. 
Oh, uh, um, an updated side by side. No, not even updated side by side, but any changes that we made in the previous versions of my proposed amendments, I'd throw those out and it's only relevant relative to what the Senate's version that we, because none of those proposals were adopted. So I'm sorry, Brent, go ahead. That would, I think that would require some annotation because you did a lot of moving things around as well. It's not just a straight highlighted differences, um, but so that would probably take a little bit longer. Well, I guess, I guess the question is what we would precisely vote on because we wouldn't vote on something that doesn't, that has a proposed amendment that we never adopted. In, in right. I know myself, um, I, would, I would like a clean copy to vote on if that's possible. Right, so, so Tom, when you say clean copy, what do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, I, I guess uh, uh, the, just the language that, that we're voting on. Right, the actual language, no highlighting, just yeah, no highlighting, the, nothing. The newest, I mean, the, the, the yeah. bill as it uh, as mm -hmm. as it's going to be moved along, uh, uh, but realizing that it may not have uh, uh, been proofread and and right. some you know some some comma, commas and and eyes mm -hmm. uh, dot type things. So. Yeah. Re edited. Yeah. Right. So, for instance, uh, right now on page six, all the language that struck out in page six, that's not. That shouldn't be in this next version, right? Because right. that right, right. Okay. Right. All right. Yeah, assume. that's what I would assume. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. I knew All that right, you yeah. know how to do this, Bren. It's just yeah. I want to get it set in my head. No, <laughs> I want yeah. to make sure everyone has what they need. So okay, great. And so and Bryn, you'll be available mm -hmm. for folks to email if you have questions, right? And we'll all be on the floor. Um, all right, and then that will give us more time to read it, have questions talk to each other, whatever, and then um, come back tomorrow. Um, Nader, do you have a, your hand is up? Okay, no, okay. All right, great, well, thank you everybody. I'm sorry that I, <laughs> we didn't get to have a break, but I, I do appreciate everybody's input. Um, I think it's great work. The um, um, House Corrections did vote out the bill, and actually I, I, I think they put it on a bill that renamed one of the courthouses I I don't I want to get that correct but any, but anyway I think it's a, a happy resolution <laughs> that's that's the bill uh, with the commissioner's language yeah yeah okay. and that's um, that's a good one yeah and I'm sorry I'm just not not seeing it but um, somewhere in my text I know that representative Evans found that the committee was quite happy that that they could do a strike all and put it on so thank yep. you good so, all right. See everybody soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Great. And um, and so I'll work with Lori to put the 830 to 930 tomorrow. Great.